episode of Surviving the Survivor, we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to this live episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And if you if you feel like you just saw me, it is because you just did uh, a sad day today. Uh, we have, of course, been covering very closely the story of Riley Strain, the 22-year-old University of Missouri student who went missing exactly two weeks ago, uh, Friday night. And uh, police, the chief in Nashville, uh, reporting to the media that Riley Strain's body was found in the Cumberland River uh, by a business worker, someone who works on the river around 7 a.m. this morning. Um, Obviously, uh, the plan today was and still is to cover uh, Caleb Harris and have our typical show. And uh, usually, as you all know, Fridays are fun days and we'll still have some fun, um, but we will be thinking of Riley Strain's family throughout all this. And I just want to get the experts' reaction uh, as we start off. A quick programming note, 2 p.m. Eastern, both Phil and Scott today have to leave right at 2 on the nose. Um, And that is okay. Uh, I will miss them deeply and they will have a good weekend. But uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern, there will be a press conference with Riley Strain's family. At least that is scheduled for now. And I've reached out to Steve Fisher, uh, Detective uh, Dr. Detective Troy Looney, and a few others to join us for that. And we will take that press conference live. Um, it seems like we'll ask Phil and Scott, why are there so many missing people? Because uh, I was planning to talk, and we will still, about Caleb Harris today. But first, Phil Waters, you are the veteran homicide detective. You are... Uh, 400 homicide investigations in in your lifetime. Uh, This, they say, there is no foul play. Are you surprised um, by the circumstances that Riley Strain was found about eight miles downstream in the Cumberland River? Given what we knew and the evidence that we saw, uh, no, not, not surprised at all. That is where I think we all surmised uh, that that was what was going to happen when he is found. That's where he's going to be found. And all the evidence seemed to lead in that direction. So it's a kind of a bittersweet day, right? So he was lost. He's now found and it's unfortunate that it's a recovery. And so our prayers certainly go out to his family. Uh, and there he is Riley strain with his mom, Michelle white and she's been, um, in the media spotlight all week and uh, pretty much almost almost unable to speak, devastated. So, um, Scott Duffy, there's no such thing as closure, but there's an ending to this story now that uh, his body was found. Your thoughts on this sad Friday? Yeah, every parent's nightmare, right? And I read somewhere about the father talking about his worst nightmare is every parent's worst nightmare is you send your child off to college or to to live life away from home and uh, and they experience life, the good, the bad, the ugly. And uh, especially at such a young age and in college, taking in that full throttle of experiences and you know, one of those experiences are obviously uh, alcohol. And um, and so, it, you know, most times you get to experience um, alcohol in ways where you're surrounded by loved ones. You don't have any issues. You wake up with a horrible hangover headache and life goes on. And this is not one of those situations this is a very sad day but as phil said absolutely bittersweet i think as as all the evidence in the picture is showing his his stumbling and um and and then of course uh, uh a family sharing a um i would call it a drunk text it's just this is where everything led to and then we had talked about it with regards to the river and and witnesses, et cetera, showing heading towards that river. And 
And then uh, water is not kind. Water is very dangerous, and especially something like that in the, in the currents. Um, hard enough to get out for, for the strong, and then, of course, uh, overwhelming for anyone incapacitated. So I, I agree with Phil, a bitter, bitter, sweet day. The family um, now has has an ending to to a story I think they they were uh, hoping against, but but knowing that it was probably um, not going to be found alive. Yeah. So uh, Chief John Drake spoke. It was a very short uh, little impromptu pr press conference. I'm going to play it for us and then get your both your reactions to it and a couple of things that I wanted to add. Uh, keep, keep in mind uh, this shirt that he's wearing here. Uh, the chief addresses it. Here we go. Uh, if I can get it to play. This morning we have a uh, unfortunate update for you on the Riley Strange search. Chief John Drake, Metropolitan Nashville Police Department, will be speaking with you. Chief Drake. Thank you, Don. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning around 7.28 a.m., we received a call uh, from a worker on uh, 61st Avenue uh, at a company that adjourns the uh, Cumberland River that had been searching for um, anything that would uh, pop up on the river, um, especially looking for Riley Strain, if he would uh, surface here. As they were removing um, an object from the river, uh, they saw, they noticed uh, what appeared to be Riley Strain um, pop up. Uh, the fire department uh, was called in, um, retrieved the body from the river. Uh, the medical examiner's office uh, reviewed the body and we've confirmed uh, that it is uh, Riley Strain. Uh, the family uh, has been contacted. Uh, that if there are no signs of foul play at this time, according to the examination here at the uh, riverbank. Uh, Mr. Strain still had the shirt on that he was wearing, uh, so had the watch and other identifying factors that helped us identify who he is. I want to say uh, to the family, uh, my heart and prayers go out to you all. Uh, for this very unfortunate and tragic uh, incident. Also want to say thank you to the Nashville community and the outpouring community of the outpouring support from the community uh, in trying to help us locate uh, Mr. Strain. Also want to say thank you to our USAR team and, and to the fire department and OEM and TWRA and everyone else, including the media for everything that you've done for the countless tips that came in. Uh, we received nearly 200 tips as of yesterday that we were vetting out. Um, so at this time, the family's been notified. Uh, there would be an autopsy uh, more than likely sometime today, and, uh, and we'll have a little bit further uh, from that point. So thank you. Yeah, there's no other evidence that suggests anything other than uh, we have reports that uh, normally uh, under these circumstances with, with his height and weight that he could have surfaced between 14 and 20 days. Uh, this is the 14th day. Uh, so we were uh, really expecting uh, anytime soon to uh, to find him. In fact, our search teams are going to put in in the water here uh, this morning and then search from this point further down. Uh, so uh, we were in the right spot. It's just unfortunate. But there's nothing to suggest anything other than any foul play at all. Yes, that's uh, so the workers typically on the river, whether it's barge companies, concrete companies, other businesses that actually are on the river, and they uh, they look routinely, as has happened countless times before. And as they moved, I believe, a barge, and don't quote me on that, they removed something from the river, and as they moved it, they noticed uh, Mr. Strain, so, and, ca and called it in. Mm -hmm. Typically work on the water. They weren't necessarily searching. Right, 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 yeah. Okay, okay thank you all. <clears throat> thank you. 
So that was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Chief John Drake with the uh, Nashville uh, Metropolitan Police Department. Um, they get a call around 7 a.m. It's from a worker who's working alongside the river. They're moving an object, which he said not to quote him on, but an, a barge-like object. And then Riley Strain's uh, body pops to the top. Um, they call, obviously, the police. They contact police. Police contacts fire. And uh, it is confirmed to be Riley Strain. Uh, that is because he had this, not that shirt. Let me get the other picture. He had the same shirt on, this one. Uh, that he was seen in. Now, there were reports, Phil Waters, all kinds of stories out there and by major networks, we'll not name any names, who said, well, a homeless person took this shirt. Uh, even the family pushed back on that and said it was just rumor. Um, Phil Waters, is this why we have to uh, wait? Uh, there were theories that he was abducted, all these sorts of things. But now um, an autopsy is going to be performed I assume, by the way, that from the autopsy, they'll be able to tell if he either drowned um, or not. Uh, but your thoughts on what we just heard from the chief? Well, like the chief came out, just stated the facts of the recovery. Uh, and that was it. Of course, then the media does what the media does. They just ask the same questions that have already been answered. And uh, he tells them again, the circumstances. So. I, I think that all the conjecture that we talked about that was popping up all over the interwebs and all that kind of thing, you know, I I look at all that stuff, um, don't pay much attention to it. We didn't pay much attention to it. We've discussed it. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that looks to see where the evidence leading. And from the beginning of this thing, it, it was – apparent to me and many others that uh, they're going to find him in that river. I mean, that's just where it led. And so the, the, uh, the autopsy is going to determine the cause of death. And I'm sure the, the manner of death will likely be ruled uh, an accident. And, and Phil, um, just, uh, flesh that out a little bit more so an autopsy will be able to tell if he was still alive when he entered the water they'll look at the lungs to see if there's water in there if for some reason the autopsy shows that he was deceased before entering the water that's likely not the case i want to be clear but if the autopsy shows that he was deceased before entering the water does that change the whole investigation or what I don't think so because they're going to determine unless there's a bullet hole or a knife wound or something that would indicate that there's some other other cause of death other than the drowning. But I don't suspect that to be the case here. I I think um, I, what I'm going to be curious to see is what the what the BAC is, what the blood alcohol content is, and any other substances that might have been in his system at the time. So he's clearly. You know, by looking at the videos, he was uh, there was no doubt that he was in distress of some kind for whatever reason, and uh, meandered about and ends up in that river. So I, uh, there was a credit card I think found a couple of days ago by some folks down there on the bank, and so the uh, and it, and it sounds like from the chief's description here that the body was between something and they said they removed something and then all of a sudden they see his body so it sounds like it it got uh, uh wedged in in between something or behind something and it's fortunate that you got people down the river that were moving that whatever that was around that object and able to recover riley and that that's in, in a case like this that is the only comfort that's going to come to the family is the fact that they found him and they can give him a proper uh, uh, burial and, and uh, have a celebration of life for this young man that, you know, horrible, horrible tragedy. Horrific. Uh, just 22 years old, literally his entire life ahead of him. He was a university of Missouri student, uh, hadn't even graduated yet, but I, 
uh, did hear from the family that he had a job lined up in finance. Um, obviously, uh, we'll never be able to take that job. So uh, horrible. But Scott Duffy, uh, there are some major uh, news anchors in the true crime space who were reporting over and over. Number one, about how the police were doing a poor job. Number two, how um, this shirt was actually being worn by a homeless person. Um, and the family pushed back on it. And now we find out that the shirt was found on his person. Uh, his Apple watch was found. Those were the two big uh, indicators because this is uh, this is the shirt right here you're looking at on the left. Um, is that kind of a cautionary tale for people uh, like myself and the media and others to just not jump to conclusions and uh, kind of have a little more respect for the uh for the work that police do and the time that it takes to do it. Yeah, it's I mean it's respect for the process and I think Joel you're especially this this Friday show and anything that Phil and I cover with you we are always um waiting for the evidence. You'll see that sometimes we're slow to respond to a question because there's not enough to go on and it's one thing to theorize and speculate. That's what law enforcement does. That's what they need to do. And um, until evidence uh, steers them in the in a different direction. And uh, obviously the rumors were out there through all types of social media and then caught on by, by major newscasters. But as Phil had stated, everything that we have seen and that's been displayed video-wise for him falling into a pole, um, and momentarily, it looks like whether he's um, dazed or unconscious comes to and continues on. They are, whatever is in his system, they are obvious signs um, of some sort of incapacitation, drugs, alcohol, whatever. And, um, and so it was just one street camera, or some other camera after another capturing uh, this unfortunate journey that just showed and, and then combine, of course, with witnesses from the bar. Hey, um, he was asked to leave or whatever, um, because they, they observed this intoxication. So all, all that combined it, it, uh, and then of course the fact that he's not found for two weeks and everybody, um, weighing in on, Hey, he was this, he was that he was kidnapped. There was a car following. It's amazing what people can do with snapshots of video and come up with a whole narrative. Our job, Phil and I and so forth, our, we, we, we try to let the evidence dictate. And then, um, and, and then uh, of course, you hope against hope sometimes. Um, but with the river being there, the river being in close proximity to where he was last going, it seemed that that would be the ultimate uh, resting place. And I like the way the uh, the chief talked about how they were already um, in communication with experts, experts that say, hey, when a body goes in uh, to a river, to any body of water, this is what happens to the body. Um, and so they were already um, using every available resource, scientific, anybody that had any sense of uh, expertise to offer. So that way police can theorize and, and put a plan in place. And then it, from what it sounds like where this barge was or whatever this object in the river was, it, it, it was in a position um, to, to stop the flow of the body. And, and uh, that's, that's, that's exactly what happened. And so now you have a recovery. And, and then, of course, the end story tells people to be careful um, because it's not helping law enforcement, it's not helping the family, and it's not not finding uh, Riley. So, um, if anyone is hearing what appears to sound like a reindeer, it's this guy on a morbid day. That's Fred Brown. Um, he will not leave me alone. Um, he has to physically be attached to me, or he uh, throws a fit. Fred Brown, say hello. Everyone needs to see a puppy today. Frederick Morris, Roosevelt Brown, say hello. He's got a bow tie on. Uh, a nice little, little camera guy. shy, I think. Little camera shy. A little camera shy. But if I put him down, it's going to sound like Santa Claus and his reindeer. He's got a little bell on him. But that's uh, the least of the worries. It's uh, one of those days in Miami. It is pouring here, so it's kind of 
fitting for a sad story and um we'll continue to push through it scott duffy just um the chief did say that um there will there will be an autopsy today and even said that likely that we will get results um people are asking still maybe he was drugged will the autopsy put to rest uh, most of these questions i i i think so i think an autopsy will you know um do its job to put to rest and and you can have every imaginable um piece of evidence in place to where law enforcement can close this case right a missing person endangered person however the call and the the investigation is pursued and then to close this case and um you you will always have your conspiracy theorists that say what if what if but ultimately it's between law enforcement and the family of riley and uh i think um when when the investigation is complete with that being the autopsy and the findings being presented to the investigators and subsequently to the family it will uh it will put this this case to a close investigative wise and um and i you know that 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 will be that uh phil waters it is the uh, spring break time uh for college kids and young kids younger and becky sassone here says men need the buddy system too we often think about you know young women what is your uh words of wisdom your cautionary advice to parents and young adults who are on college break this week next week uh when they're going to go out they're going to go with their friends they're going to have some uh drinks and they're going to get a little crazy um because that's what college kids do uh should they always try to stay in groups what would you say to the parents and these young people well you know, when we were doing spring break, when I was in college, I mean, it hasn't, I don't think circumstances have changed much in the celebration of spring break in the college world. It's always been kind of a uh, crazy, crazy time. And young people think that they, that one week period gives them some sort of license to go out and do things that are incredibly stupid and think there will be no consequences. So in terms of the drinking and, and all of that kind of stuff, the I think there's some mention that he was in a fraternity. These were fraternity brothers that were with him at the club. I was in a fraternity. Those guys, you know, it's a close-knit group for the most part. And it's unfortunate here that somebody in that group when they understood that he had been asked to leave the bar and he was leaving that someone didn't go with him now i, I have read where that there, there was one of them that went down apparently with him outside and he told them he was going to walk back to the hotel he's okay which was not terribly far as i understand from the from the bar so but, you know, given what we see on the video of his state of intoxication, you know, you can always say could have, should have. And I'm not placing any blame on anyone. I'm just saying that someone should have stepped up and said, look, I'm going to go back with you. So if I had any advice, I would just say if you're going to go out in a group, a large, uh, you know, or even if it's just you and, and one other person, uh, you all need to watch out for each other. And if you see, if one of you is getting out of control in the sense that you don't have any, you're not even cognizant of, of the loss of your faculties, then you, maybe you need to put the night of partying behind you and get them back to the hotel room. And then you can go out the next day and you can start it all over again. But this you know, self-absorption that people have these days of, you know, I'm just going to go get mine and, uh, you know, whatever is going on over there, they'll take care of that themselves. And then when something like this happens, now we're all looking around trying to blame somebody for it. So 
Um, people just have got to be, have got to learn that they've got to be responsible and they got to be responsible for the things they take part in and the consequences of those things, whether they be good or whether they be bad. So uh, again, this whole situation here was, uh, was avoidable and it's, it's just a terrible, tragic outcome. And I just, to say that, you know, my heart goes out to the parents is not enough. I mean, it's just uh, words, words are hard to find to try to minimize the effect that this has had or, or soften the effect that it's had on this family. So I, um, you got to think about what the possibilities are when you go out and doing this party stuff, especially in spring break, because of course the tendency is you get caught up in the moment. You got a lot of people that are doing the same thing you're doing and there are strength in numbers when it comes to go out and acting like a bunch of idiots on a beach somewhere or downtown in a bar. So, um, yeah, you got to think about it. You see, uh, Sharon Thea Newman to my three favorite heroes, a huge thank you. Your input is invaluable. Love you all. Thank you so much. And look at that. Uh, you learned something. Spring break was no different in 1867 when Phil was in college. <laughs> said it was basically the same. Did you know that, Scott Duffy? That uh, hasn't changed for uh, 175 years. No, Phil, you know, that he looks younger than I do. Um, one of the questions that keeps coming up, Scott Duffy, uh, tox reports. Um, how long will those take? Uh, we always ask you. I think that takes much longer, Scott. Yeah, and and there are lots of factors that that uh, get put into the formula. I, I would say anytime I needed a toxicology report, and often whether it be uh, like er, my early days of doing doing DUIs and uh, taking somebody for for a blood test as opposed to a breath test, and and then wait for the blood to come back because I, you know, there's drugs involved, or at least what I thought. And, uh, and I would be told anywhere from two to eight weeks, right? I would always hope on the shorter end. It all depends where I'm in the log, how important this is, how necessary this is. And so all that plays into um, a particular department that may have a high, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a amount of tests that are going through. Will this get bumped up in the queue, of course, right? Because of, of everything that's going on. But typically they... It, uh, it is a considerable amount of time, but, um, but, but then the factors of, of everything that's in play here, um, it's a matter of getting bumped up in the queue and, and getting those tests done. So I would imagine it would be on the shorter end, but it can take up to a couple of months for sure. Uh, well, now we, uh, by the way, 2 p.m. Eastern time. The family is scheduled to speak. There will be a press conference. Uh, the mother, Michelle White, it has been uh, understandably beside herself. So I can't imagine she's going to say much. But Chris uh, Springman, who's been on our show and is the family spokesperson and the stepfather, I'm sure will offer a few words of thanks. We'll take that live. And I've confirmed with Steve Fisher. Um, we will switch over. Um, I'm going to hop off of here a few minutes before 2 uh, let Phil and Scott go at that point, and then we will take that. But now there is another story here, uh, similar and different. Uh, this is a missing Texas A&M student, Caleb Harris, and you see a photo of this young man, 21 years old. Um, a $25,000 reward is now being offered. I'm going to read the tips number for those listening, 361 826-2950. That's 361-826-2950. And here it is. Um, the family and friends have kind of cobbled together uh, money uh, for this $25,000 reward. Uh, there is a catch here. We'll go through the details of this case. This one is really kind of a head scratcher. Um, I keep saying it is Dingman, Chris Dingman. I'm saying Springman. Apologies, Chris Dingman, uh, not Springman. So Chris Dingman, but um, this $25,000 reward is only good, I believe, through the end of March. Yeah, March 31st, and it's uh, close to that. So they want to get a sense of urgency um, in the community. Phil Waters 
Have you heard of these types of rewards? And again, we'll get into the details of what happened to him. But have you heard of a reward having a, a cap of time on it? I can't recall that really. But again, they're offering this money just until March 31st. And as you can see, he went missing on March 4th. Well, usually when the reward is this high, it's because family and their uh, friends have put up the money. So these things don't just happen. They just, just put up a reward and there you go. I know in Houston, we have Crime Stoppers, I'm assuming in Corpus Christi area, that area down there, they have the same type of, of, a, of a system. And Crime Stoppers will put in a certain amount of money at the beginning of these types of investigations. And then if there's any money on top of that, it's put in by businesses or family or third parties, and they have to have the money before the reward is shown. So there may be a time frame on this because that's the that's the time in which these folks can put up the money. And if it's if it's if it's if he's found or if they receive a clue that leads to finding Caleb then they can they can pay out the reward money but there may be some financial strain or restriction that is going to put a timeline put a a time frame on the on the time that the reward is offered so his father uh, came out publicly and said the end of the month deadline was set to try and create again a quote unquote sense of urgency in anyone who might have key information about what happened to his son the direct quote here is, you know, we're going into our third week and, you know, at this point we haven't found him on the ground search and we're looking everywhere we possibly can and staying steadfast in our faith and knowing that he's out there. Somebody knows something. Somebody knows where he is and hope this will encourage somebody to do the right thing. And let's get Caleb back home. Uh, Scott Duffy, uh, sweet and salty with a very big question here. How do people just simply vanish without a trace in these days with cameras everywhere? This case is particularly perplexing once you hear all the details, but why do so many people go missing, Scott? I know it's a variety of reasons. Some people run away, whatever, but um, here, and obviously in Riley Strain's case, um, you know, the circumstances were a little different. This one, again, is a head scratcher. Um, once you hear the details, but what, what is behind so many missing people? Because in researching the story, you know, it's just one after the next. Yeah, the, the number is staggering. It is high. And, um, you know, people go, like you said, Joel, people go missing for a variety of reasons. Many just, you know, voluntarily. Hey, it's um, I'm either leaving because I can't take this I can't take my job. I have debts. I have to disappear, whatever it is, whatever be the reason. But there's a voluntariness to that leaving. I've located people in Delaware when I was working in different, you run them through NCIC. NCIC is that, that national computer, that criminal database that also missing uh, endangered people are putting it, are put in. And um, I've, I've stopped people. They've come back, what we call a hit. In other words, it's, hey, uh, stop and detain. And you would have a conversation. They're like, I'm just not going back. I'm tired of my wife. I'm tired of my life, whatever it is. You uh, you determine that they're of, that they have the proper mental uh, acuity and whatnot. And, um, and then, you know, I, I, on the road, I would be uh, making a connection to a law enforcement that put the, that person in. And then we would come to an agreement that, okay, this person of their own free will is... Um, wants to stay out of that, whatever it is, that area. And, um, and, and that would be it. They, they go on their way. So there are many factors. Um, but I agree this, this, uh, at least from what we're hearing, what's being put out, we're always skeptical or at least, uh, um, cautious with what law enforcement has close to the vest. For example, he's with roommates. I haven't seen anything though. I'm sure it's, it's, it's out there, but I haven't seen anything with regards to interviews of the roommates where the room was anybody in the household um, during this time that he walks out. And as you said, just vanishes into thin air. 
and 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 then of course ring cameras and and alike um very much like what we saw with riley street cams that showed hey he's at this intersection he's in this street he's doing that he's doing that so that those cameras paint a great picture to help determine at least what um what could have happened or what did happen and uh so so from what i gather it seems like at least from what family's putting out that um there didn't seem to be any mental stressed issues um they have a new dog who needs to go out at all hours of the night and uh and you know and ordering food from i believe uber food at uh three o'clock in the morning and a very successful delivery those all are key points and um it uh there may be things out there that we do not know a text message or something that shows something different that there was something in his life that that could help explain at least uh um what took place but but yeah, I, as from what I know and have read and what has been said, this this is a uh, true mystery that that requires urgency. Yeah. So let's get into some of the details here. So he vanished. We're now entering the third week. He he vanished on March fourth. Phil Waters and uh, this father uh, Randy Harris is pleading mm -hmm. to help find him. He was last seen in the early hours of March 4th at his apartment near his Corpus Christi uh, campus housing. His dad says he spoke to him the night he went missing. He seemed totally fine. Uh, the disappearance, according to his dad, makes absolutely no sense. Here's a direct quote from Randy Harris. There's just nothing there that would cause us to believe he was in any danger or leaving. He had actually ordered in his food for the next day for school. So that day i read he got a dog um with his friend first dog to share this dog he goes to walk the dog uh phil around three in the morning he goes out there walks the dog brings the dog back in the house and then he went back outside to pick up an uber eats order that was for the next day meal and no one ever sees him again this isn't like he was as far as we know you know drunk intoxicated um, he was now with, he was at his home. How do investigators proceed here? Um, I assume you've got to look first and foremost at this Uber driver, right? Um, is that the starting point here? No, I'd say the starting point is well before that. My first question is in something like this is, is that it's a March the 4th. Three o'clock in the morning, March the 4th. So that's a Sunday night, Monday morning. And he's washing the dog. So I, I what is he doing Sunday evening? What was he doing Sunday? So I want to know, I want to start the timeline the day before, maybe even two days before, see what his activities were who he had joined with, who he'd, he'd uh, gotten with over the weekend. Was he partying? Was he studying? What was, what was he doing over the activities? Were there any plans to do anything? And then see if we've got witnesses. Well, you may have to canvas. Well, you not may have to, but I would be canvassing that area where he lives and seeing if we have any any people that saw him during daylight hours. When was the last time they saw him? Did anybody see him after dark? And where was the last place that he was seen? And if it was at his apartment, and then he appears outside, I guess, to wash the dog at three in the morning. I am curious as to how, does it say in the article how we know that? how they know that that's what he was doing? Uh, no, it doesn't. It just, uh, these, oh. are, these are reports from, I guess his father was in contact with him that evening. Okay, so th this is presumably coming from the father? Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Okay, um, so then my, question would, my question would be, why is Caleb washing his dog at three o'clock in the morning? That seems very odd to begin with. 
unless it's possible that the dog had an accident inside the, the house or the, the residence and he's cleaning the dog up. I mean, so there's some legitimate reasons why he would be doing that. But then I'm curious as to after that's done, he decides that three o'clock in the morning, he's going to order some Uber Eats. Um, now, I can kind of associate that with he's a, he's a college student at uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi down there. And so I can think back when, you know, 150 years ago and, and I can, uh, I can remember times where uh, for whatever reason I'm up at two, three o'clock in the morning and, and I was big about ordering uh, Domino's Pizza or trying to get a hold of a pizza place to, to d- make a delivery late at night. So I can kind of see that happening, uh, but I want those questions answered. You know, why why washing the dog? If we can answer them, what in the world would he be getting something to eat? Did he order, did he order, order food for himself? Did he order food for somebody else that may have been there? So, you know, there's a lot of questions here about those particular activities. And then when he goes out and the term I think they're using is that the delivery was successful. Is that the term? Yes. It it was a success. That's what they're saying. So uh, obviously you're going to, you're going to talk to the Uber Eats delivery person and find out what they know, what kind of mood was he in? How did he appear? Did he appear to be intoxicated? Did he appear to be have all his faculties about him? So there's, a, there's just a whole host of questions here. I I would have to believe that there is not much in the way of CCTV type video or okay. Ring TV or any, uh, Ring Ring uh, cameras, uh, pictures, cameras, or anything. So. Uh, that's, that adds further mystery to this. So this is, this is a mystery with very, with very few clues, almost no clues. And you've got to go into, you got to do the deep dive here, right? You got to start peeling the onion. What, what was his situation in his personal life? Where was he in school? Uh, had he said anything to his parents or were any friends that he was despondent about anything? So there's a whole a whole host of questions to try to get an idea of what, where he was at that point in time in just terms of his, his personal life and what he was dealing with. So, because it's, it has happened before that people go missing because they choose to go missing. And I, I'm, I'm curious if, if was he, under any kind of treatment. I mean, there's just a whole, and I'm not suggesting that he was, I'm just saying these are the questions I would be asking if I was working this case. And are there any signs, any evidence around the area that would indicate that he was taken by force? Uh, and so just a lot of, a lot of questions here. And I'm sure the uh, missing persons detective, the detectives working on this case are, are, are asking all those questions. And there's just been very, very few answers to these things. So that's the reward. And then if the if the father is indicating that they're putting this time frame on it because it may create a sense of urgency with somebody who may know something, then I hope that works out. I hope that's exactly what happens to this thing. So I'm sure they're getting phone calls through Crime Stoppers or whatever uh, anonymous reporting uh, entity they have there. So, um, you know, and, and these things, gosh, you know, it's like they happen. We had a, you know, our, we kind of had a little, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, uh, uh, a harbinger for when I work homicide that things like this, events like this always seem to come in threes, you know, officers getting shot, you know, three officers in a month, you know, that kind of thing. But these kind of really, uh, types of investigations, these types of incidents seem to uh, happen in threes. And so, you know, we had Riley and then we've got Caleb. And then yesterday there's a young lady in Houston 
They went out to walk her dog, and the dog was found, and she's gone. So, um, you know, young a young lady, uh, I think 20, 25, 26 years old. But uh, these uh, these things happen, and they're all they're all a different set of circumstances. That what's that's what makes them so challenging. That they're they're all unique, and um, you only know what you know, and that's that's the you know with Riley's case, there were some real indicators of where this was going to end. Mm. In this case, in the case of this young woman I'm talking about, uh, <laughs> there is just nothing. Everything seemed to be going as it was supposed to go, and then all of a sudden, they're gone, and that's. Yes. That's uh, that's the challenge to a, a case like this, investigating it. As Phil just said, we only know what we know. And what we know so far, uh, really, the father has been the primary spokesperson. And he says it was just an absolutely typical evening um, that Caleb was a perfectly adjusted young man. Uh, no mental health issues that we know of uh, that would have caused him to be despondent. But we don't know, like Phil said, if he was maybe texting a young woman, things were going sideways. Um, Hope always uh, filling in some of the blanks here. She says the food was left at the door. One of his roommates, and by the way, the roommates have been very cooperative, helping with the search, wanting to help, which is different than the Riley Strain case where his fraternity brothers just went back to uh, Missouri, uh, didn't go with them that night, uh, not to throw uh, shade at those roommates. I'm just saying there's a difference here. These roommates have been very, uh, from what we know, uh, forthcoming. Uh, and here it says the food was left at the door. One of his roommates is his best friend, as you see from middle school. Caleb is predictable and nothing was out of the ordinary. So this is uh, from a best friend, but also the father saying uh, the exact same thing. Uh, again, here's an other quote from the father. Uh, There's nothing there that would cause us to believe he was in any danger or leaving. He had actually ordered in his food for the next day of school. So he was ordering it for himself. Uh, again, not seen or heard from since. Uber uh, said that there was no reported incident when the driver was there and Uber, uh, the company, reached out to help police. So they've been, uh, from all accounts, very cooperative. Scott Duffy, I, I would imagine here from Gretchen, wouldn't digital forensics maybe help here? Phone location, et cetera. I'll be honest. I don't know that they have his phone. I mean, he ran out to make the call. I keep my phone on me most of the time. But if I'm running out to grab Uber Eats, maybe not. Uh, so maybe he has his phone still. Maybe the phone is in the house. If, the, if he left the phone behind, Scott, I imagine that they are doing some sort of digital forensics to see messages, like, like Phil said, way before that 3 a.m. timeline uh, to see who he's talking to, if there was any kind of trouble brewing. Um, so how important is the digital forensics here? By the way, Keely Sexton saying she's not surprised at the 3 a.m. walk because the puppies, and I can attest to that, have small bladders. Fred, Moore, uh, Fred Brown is now sleeping in the corner, no longer jingling. But Scott Duffy, how important will uh, digital forensics be right now? It, it's important as long as uh, his phone is missing, right? In the, in the regard of, of location. If uh, his phone and any other um, personal digital devices he has are located in the house, then it, 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 it would go to, to creating some sort of timeline and giving a, a good idea of what's going on in his head and so forth. Um, as Phil indicated, going back several days and leading up to this point. So um, it's it's important no matter what. It, it's, it would be great if it is missing, thereby assume that he has it because we all do go everywhere with our phones. And uh, so they're able to do some emergency pinging, et cetera, to try to at least get a secondary location before it either turned off or went off, very similar to Riley's. So... Um, the uh that, that i and correct me if i'm wrong i i too haven't seen like a press conference even a local press conference from law enforcement so um this is you know we're two weeks in it is a mystery uh at least at least to us 
and uh, to those that know him. So, um, yeah, the, the digital aspects and maybe a laptop if the phone is there also any laptop, any any digital devices to give an idea of what's he looking, what's what are his searches, um, what what texts, any urgencies of anything. And then I would also, with the help of uh, Uber Eats, look at his pattern. Is it this, is this the first time he's ordered out? And uh, at this time of the morning to prepare for his next day at school, as his father said, I, I would look at that to say, wow. So the, um, as opposed to, no, he does this every Sunday night or every you know once a week or whatever. Um, so all, all those things would factor. And that comes through a digital analysis. Uh, Lori's Thrive, uh, was he washing the dog or walking the dog from what it? This was the first day he was sharing this dog with his roommate. It was the first day they had the pup and uh, he was walking the pup from what uh, from what I understand. Rosie Woods here, uh, he could be suffering from depression and choose to disappear. It's not uncommon for some to hide it. Uh, that is 100 percent a possibility, uh, but we can only go off of what we know uh, when you, you hear Phil and Scott say that all the time. And Maybe the father didn't know, but the father publicly has said that he was a very well-adjusted young man. The um, friends of his who he's had since childhood, some of them have said the uh, same thing. Uh, Bugsy is bringing up something we saw in the Riley Strain case. Maybe he hit his head. Maybe he's disoriented. A million different questions. But uh, the facts are that as of this past Wednesday, today's Friday, by the way, it has entered the third week that he's missing. Uh, he went missing March 4th. But $57,000 has been raised through a GoFundMe to help, I think, with some of this reward money and other things. I'll get that link. I'll put it into the show summary after the show. Um, now, Local 3 News spoke to the Corpus Christi police chief. The day before this interview, the police said, look, there's no new search updates. Uh, the direct quote was, this remains an active and open investigation, and we are working with multiple entities to continue the search for Caleb Harris. But the chief sat down with a local three news reporter and then the next day informed the public that the investigation has extended, and I quote here, past just a ground search. So Phil Waters, what does that mean in police parlance that it is extended past just a ground search say that again the chief said that the investigation has extended past just a ground search it is not just a ground search what does that mean well then they're looking in the water and they're looking in the air they're looking from the air um uh, that's what it would indicate to me that they're um uh, you know they've got uh, a search team out and they're utilizing all the tools that they have available to them for a search. And uh, they may be, in fact, uh, they may be using horses. I don't know the area there where he, where he is missing from. If it's heavily wooded and there's a lot of uh, bodies of water right there, excuse me, in the Corpus Christi area. And so, um, I would imagine they've they've got all those all those uh, tools at their disposal, and they have expanded just a ground search in the area there. So now they're they're starting to expand the search area. Uh, Ronnie, by the way, with some good news, Phil Waters, the girl from Houston was found alive. So That's I, awesome. Yeah, which is great. Um, That's here's good. We always have an expert in STS Nation on a particular story. It appears to be hope always here. Caleb Scott Duffy, if this is true, I have not confirmed this. And I did a lot of research, but I'm not the best researcher. So uh, Caleb was barefoot. He left his wallet, his keys, his truck. He only had his phone with him. So he did has, have his phone on his person. What in the world happened to him? He would. This is a great point. You're not going to leave with your shoes off, right? Unless you're in some kind of altered state. How does this complicate the matter or simplify the matter? Yeah, but I would go back to some some or where where is this reporting come from? So is this? Hey, his shoes are right there, but does somebody does he have flip flops or some other you know type of I you know I 
So I, I would just be cautious of, hey, the shoes are in, but hope obviously. Always, let us, hope always let us know in the chat where, and I'm doing this, uh, the COE is dealing with the kiddos. So, uh, but hope always let, let me know where you're getting this information, please. But Scott, go ahead. Yeah. So, and, and if the phone is with him, that is a, a good thing in the sense that it gives law enforcement at least a um, another avenue to pursue, again, with uh, the pinging and so forth. And and if they can come up perhaps with a secondary location before the phone, like I said, it's either going to go off or it's going to run out um, It's you know of its charge. So thereby the phones no longer can be tracked. But perhaps they came up with a secondary track um by the way scott real quick uh hope always says that his dad and his roommates publicly said that he left with no shoes on so okay so i and i take it then that that um there is some witness camera or person that indicated he was barefoot as opposed to just hey the shoes that he always wears is by the door or whatever that's i'm just that's what i'm saying is there is there a possibility there's um sliders or a flip-flop um you know like like phil likes to wear uh but but other than that yes i i would agree um in the it, i've gone out in my my yard plenty of times barefoot but i'm not going to go barefoot beyond my property line so so that's you know that's my pattern people would know that and then if i disappear it'd be like well shoes flip-flops or any other form of footwear the phone is a good thing and and that's why um, I mean, I haven't seen anything where law enforcement said it's pinged 8, 10, 15, 20 miles away, but perhaps that would lend into this has be, gone beyond a, a, um, a ground search. Ground search to me is, is the local terrain. Perhaps you start with a square mile or even a couple of hundred yards and look, wooded, water, et cetera. And then if the phone is hitting at a considerable distance, before it's la- you know, with its last known location, that could give lo- you know, if if he's with that phone, or if the phone, let's just say, for example, this is some sort of abduction, whatever have you, or whatever, um, and and then is the phone tossed out out a car, or you know, so, um, and and whatever that secondary location, you can then go out and search that area. Um, to at least try to locate uh, the phone or so it, it lends to uh, um, for law enforcement to have another avenue to to see a, a point of direction, travel, et cetera. Uh, Rongo says Caleb's apartment uh, have many bodies of water around it. I did not know this. He's not the only young male missing who had a fishing hobby. It's concerning. But then again, um, I mean, people do night fishing, but there's no indication he was going out fishing and uh, he was just walking his dog. And according to all reports, and again, this goes back, can't say it enough times, you only know what you know. And what we know is that he walked the dog, brought the dog who he had for the first day back in the house, then goes to retrieve his Uber Eats and then bam, no word uh, ever. Uh, as far as we know, there have not been any public press conferences, and Phil mentioned this. Phil Waters, uh, from a law enforcement point of view, would there be a reason for that? I would think it would be the contrary uh, th- thought process that you would want to have a press conference to get the word out. Uh, does this mean that they know something or or what? Well, first thing I want to do is is correct myself about the walking washing thing. I misunderstood what you said. I thought you said he was washing the dog at three. In no, the no, no, walking, no, no, no. And he was, he was not doing that. So disregard all that crap that I said. But <laughs> uh, uh, so the fact of the matter is, he's out. You know, at three in the morning walking the dog. That's not something that's strange. Uh, I know that uh, our poppy dog gets my wife up at three o'clock in the morning to to do that same thing. So that that's all sounds legit. Now I'm, I'm in terms of the press conference stuff. The father's been very visible. It, it, it's been all over the news. Um, the, the police department continues to release, do press releases, and so forth and so on. You know the the need for a press conference. 
for something that's already high visibility. I don't know that at this point it's necessary. I'm reading here where they have received some leads in the last two days that's now expanding the investigation to the San Antonio and New Braunfels area. So, uh, which means they're, I would imagine they're getting all manner of phone calls and gosh, you know, we don't know what we don't know about what's going on in people's lives. So there may be something going on in Caleb's life that his parents are not aware of. And what I'm hoping for is that they find him in San Antonio or New Braunfels, and he just needed a break for whatever it was going on in his life. Um, so, but, but the, but the phone stuff, <clears throat> who was he talking to? Was he talking to somebody while he was walking the dog? Was he texting with someone? Is there something that might be a clue as to what would make him, suddenly say, I just want to get away for a few weeks and sort things out. So, and I, I'm sure that there are many things that we don't know that the police are not releasing at this point in time. And that's to maintain the integrity of the, of the investigation, whatever it may be. So I don't, I don't find it in particular, to be strange that two weeks out, they haven't had a press conference. So, uh, you know, the, the father's been on the, been on, you know, high visibility, offering the reward. So they're doing all the things that need to be done. This thing, nobody, nobody that is paying attention doesn't know about Caleb Harris. Uh, so the chief went on, uh, Scott Duffy, about digital forensics, which people, including PSS here, is asking about. There's a lot going on on the other side. The chief says the technical side, as far as the digital search and those types of things. Uh, so there's a whole lot going on that we're doing. Um, the chief also said, though, that uh, there's no known motive, no leads about any possible sub uh, suspect, uh, they did interview the roommates, friends, and family. And as Phil just said, they also now have extended this search to his hometown of New Braunfels, New Braunfels and also San Antonio. So, Scott, um, we'll get to PSS's question in a minute, but to Phil's point, what does it tell you that they're now going to his hometown and also San Antonio? Does that mean that they did get a tip? Uh like a hot lead? Yeah, if it's something that uh, they're going to come out and say, it's something that they feel is credible. Um, and it and that could be through a couple of ways, a sighting, a, a credible sighting. Um, if he does have his phone, a last known ping, um, some sort of messaging or something that show that um, they were able to intercept uh, to indicate that there's a planned meeting. I, and and so if, if you could educate the the northeasters easterners uh, with geography, what is the what's what's the distance, for example, where he he was in Corpus Christi and home San Antonio? Is that is that a large? Uh, Phil, you live in Texas. I have no, my geography is quite poor. Uh, the dog is not missing the dog. He brought the dog back in the house. Then yeah. he went to the Uber eats order and that's when he disappeared. But Phil, how far do you have any idea? Corpus Christi is from, from New Braunfels and or San Antonio. Uh, it's not terribly far. It's, I mean, it's not within walking distance, of course, but, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, it, it would depend. It's not, Here's there's the a reason answer. why they're looking in those areas. In fact, they're, I'm sure there's, they've, they've got something somewhere that's led them to the area there. There may be individuals there that they want to go down there and interview. It may be the person that he was last on the phone with. Uh, and so they're, they're heading that direction to, uh, to talk to those folks. So, um, you know, By the way, uh, Ned, Ned Smith says Corpus Christi is about two hours away. 
Burning Queen says three hours. Jessica says one and a half. So let's go with about two, uh, roughly two hours away. Yeah. Um, Depending Scott, how fast you're traveling. Yeah, Scott Duffy, the the uh, the surgeon, the esteemed doctor, PSS, wanted mm -hmm. to know if they can access. And we did a show on this yesterday yeah. regarding Donna Adelson. Can they access the cloud without his phone? Yeah, that's a good question. I I have some assumptions, but I don't. Uh, I am not your your digital expert. But you know, typically, I I, I think um, where technology is today, anything on the device requires that device. For example, your SIM, whatever storage, and the cloud is outside that device. So I I would imagine between uh, the the providers and and then of course with proper search warrant and whatnot, the assistance of um, your tech and uh analytical experts that that they're that you can access uh but but i would happily stand corrected um because in my career i do not recall doing search warrants for cloud information um and receiving that outside so i'm i would happily be educated on that so i don't know i would assume yes uh, because it's you know the cloud is 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 obviously on some other um, server, some other um, storage outside that device. Uh, the question keeps coming up: Why would you buy a puppy and leave it that same night uh, of your own will? That's likely uh, he was sharing the puppy. Uh, number one, um, I guess not everyone has the same affinity for puppies. Number two, and if there was something bigger going on, let's. I'm not saying this is the case, but people are asking about his mental health. If you're depressed, you're probably not thinking clearly if that was the case, but we just don't know. Uh, Jana Island, back to Riley Strain for a moment. My heart is broken for Riley's mother. My girls and their friends were in Nashville the same night as Riley and were in the same bars around the same time. All those kids should have come home safe. My dad always says life is a game of inches. Um, Horrific ending to that story again, and uh, there's nothing uh, any of us could say to his parents. They are going to be holding a press conference, and we're going to take that at 2 o'clock, and eventually the COE will let me know. Uh, I think we can redirect you there uh, in a little while. Just to sort of put a, a cap, a feather in the cap on this, um, Scott Duffy, this is your world. Uh, the chief did say that um, they have turned to the FBI and even the Texas Rangers and the marshals for guidance. That's what they're the, the terminology that they're using and and other resources as well that he wasn't willing to divulge. But Scott Duffy, what does that mean that they're turning to the FBI for guidance in this? And then let's have like 20 minutes of lightness uh, before these guys go today. We'll cover some uh, less serious stories, but Scott, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that would incorporate uh, digital um, forensic assistance through the FBI's CAST unit, which is stands for a Cellular Analysis Surveillance Team. They have some great people, and 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 departments have great analytical support, but some departments don't. Right, it is a costly and time consuming. Uh, training to get all that. So why not request the help of of experts that are readily available and that are going to come in? So I can I can uh, um, uh, safely say that that those um, resources have been requested of and are being offered. And but then there are other things that law enforcement. This is where law enforcement has to hold things close to the vest, especially if they're on on uh, tracking some really good leads and and offering to the public anything they're doing could uh, interfere or inhibit. So they 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 may already have some sort of uh, background that they've come across. Uh, like Phil said, it could be anything, uh, 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 some sort of mental distress or or some other um, uh, activity and whatnot th that th they are able to pursue these leads. You know, there might be an open federal case or something. Any any one of those um, aspects are plausible 
in this and and then to lead them to another location because it does ultimately come down to why leave your truck if you are willingly voluntarily traveling it, it doesn't make sense it defies reason so is it possible possible that um there is a waiting car and he voluntarily gets in that car and, and then the unknown happens. So all everything is on the table for law enforcement until a piece of evidence takes them in a different direction. Well, he's from he's from New Braunfels, which is just the other side of San Antonio. So that's where they're heading into that area. I mean, there's gosh, there's a possibility that for whatever reason he got somebody to pick him up and headed back to where he's familiar. Yeah. I mean, uh, the fact that they are sending people to San Antonio and New Braunfels, that area, uh, and New Braunfels is just a, you know, a click away from, from San Antonio. So, um, I'm hoping that's maybe a sign that that's some good news that they've got, you know, I, I think what's important now, if he is, if he, if that's what's happened, if he's gone somewhere because he wanted to go there because he was struggling with something that very few people knew anything about, that he doesn't get in a frame of mind that he thinks he's in trouble, which would keep him from saying, look, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, so that, I, that's what I hope is not happening. I, I'm, Hoping and praying he's he's alive and well somewhere by his own volition. And uh, he's just having to contemplate, gosh, what are going to be the consequences for coming out and saying, look, I'm, you know, I did this. I walked away because of something going on in my life. And uh, and he's just fearful now that, you know, uh, what the repercussions are going to be. So. You know, it, but it sounds like they've got something to go on. Something they're, they're they're talking to some people about about that in that area where he is from, and then the San Antonio area where I'm sure he has friends. So San Antonio, the chat is telling me is roughly two hours from uh, Corpus Christi, and then New Braunfels. Yeah. I'm not sure in what direction. It's about 40 minutes from San Antonio, so they're headed there. Um, Katie it's north. It's kind of northeast, I think, of San Antonio, if I remember right. Uh, Katie Moore says, for all the moms who had to bury their children, including myself, God bless you with a super uh, sticker here, super chat. Very sorry to hear that. We keep trying to have like fun Friday shows, but for some reason it has been difficult. Um, Jim Jimmy McNutty here says, I'm trying to think of sitting in a bar with Scott and Phil having a lighthearted conversation. It would have to be something like being pickpocketed or stubbing a toe because it's always all homicides. Good point. Maybe it's Scott and Phil that I should blame for, uh, you know, feeling uh, down today. But anyway, $25,000 reward for Caleb Harris. Uh, if you have information, please call 361-826-2950, 361-826-2950. Literally have 10 minutes on the nose. We'll go through some other stories, have a little bit of fun in 10 minutes on some crazy other stories. And... Um, then I have to run and these guys have to run. Uh, I'm going to be covering the uh, press conference with Riley Strange family. Let me get the COE in here for one minute. COE, welcome back. Um, when I say goodbye in 10 minutes, uh, will everyone be redirected? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. There's well, your I, answer. Will they be redirected? I'm not leaving my room. It's, it's raining so hard I decided to stay in uh, – Studio 1K. I did not go to the other studio. Uh, COE. Yes, I went. Thank you, J Mac. I appreciate that. <laughs> hey, J Mac. Um, COE, can you put up a photo of J Mac? Today was a dress up. Look at him. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, it's a fun Friday. He, look, he looks like, he looks like John Cessna. Oh, here. Oh, wait. And your UFC belt. Cena. Where's your belt? Oh. Oh, Cena, John Cena, is that his name? Cena, John, John Cena. Cena. He wore his belt to school. It was dress up day at school. He went as a UFC fighter. I've ruined this for me. Careful. Yeah. There's the belt. Put it. Oh, hey. there we go. 
The champs hold it over their shoulder, over their shoulder, like a real champ. And now you got to flex. You got to flex. You also need a haircut. You need a haircut. No, no, can I show them the Thanks, oh, it's that, maybe that's for another time, honey. Kid thinks it's his show. Oh, you made that? That's awesome. Very good. Very good. I love you. Another time, Judah. Okay, Joel. See you in a minute. I didn't get my answer. He's got, dude, you got muscles. Yes, he does. Okay. Uh, Phil Waters, California pastor. California pastor out of Bakersfield. He hires a hitman. To murder his daughter's boyfriend. The boyfriend survives. Boyfriend is shot up. They've now arrested the pastor. This is according to Riverside uh, Police, Riverside County Police. The male adult victim stated he was driving on Grove Community Drive, approaching Plainview Street when another vehicle pulled up alongside him. Gunfire came from the other vehicle and he was struck several times. The victim drove himself to the hospital was treated for his injuries. Then detectives uncovered the evidence. The pastor, the father, paid a hitman $40,000. Uh, both have been arrested, both facing first-degree murder charges. Phil, my question to you, how can a man of God, you're a man of God, how can a man of God hire a hitman to kill the daughter's boyfriend? How could he? How could he, Phil? I guess he uh, he found the guy and uh, called him up and said, hey, give you some coin here if you take care of this guy that's annoying the crap out of me. So uh, I don't I don't find that terribly mystifying. I mean, look, we're all flawed. And uh, who knows? Uh, who knows? Uh, you know, I've got <laughs> I had, I've got daughters. I know there are a couple of people that they were around that I would have just I would, you know, walked out and shot myself. I mean, I wouldn't hire somebody to do it. But, um, uh oh, it looks like we have an emergency I'll going keep, on I'll there. Talking to see how we camera. Keep going. We'll keep going. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? I mean, there you go. He's just, uh, he's a dad. He's a dad before he's a pastor. I can tell you that. So, I'm not saying what he did was right, but. He he felt like he had a reason to do what he did, but um, there you go. And there you go. The COE letting me know, by the way, that this press conference actually started a moment ago. We're not, we're not going to do anything different. At 2 o'clock, we're going to take the entire press conference, so stand by with us. You'll be redirected in five minutes' time. I'm going to have to say goodbye to these guys, and we will get back on. Uh, you will all be redirected, from what I understand, and we'll take the entire – press conference uh in its entirety but um anyway so you've got a pastor and uh he how much did, did he pay the guy 40 grand phil 40 grand 40 grand well the uh the coffers and the church offering must have been quite good uh yes. for the last couple of weeks i wonder if that's a line item in the church budget you know uh <laughs> They always say it's impossible to find a hitman, but every day there's a story about a hitman. Is it really that hard to find a oh, hitman? Oh, you can find some idiot out there that, you know, is a hitman. They're just, uh, you know, the the cases that I have worked that are murder for hire cases, uh, I've been shocked at how cheap some of these guys will go and kill somebody. <laughs> if it were me, it's got to be at least six digits. I mean, I'm not going to do it. It's got to be enough. It's probably got to be seven. It's got to be enough for me to be able to go do it and then go live somewhere else for the rest of my life unencumbered by law enforcement. So uh, there is a number. There is. It's a What's four. that? There is a number. <laughs> it's a four. There is a number. There is a number, but it's it's uh, it's it's pretty high. It's pretty high. Phil Waters, do you think that you could get away with the perfect murder knowing what you know? It's an interesting question. Could you, Phil Waters? Well, I don't think I'm going to share that information with you, Joel. <laughs> he took a real long pause there. That made, that made me worried. Um, let's not go there. That's uh, that's upsetting me. Why are you offering me a uh, a job of some kind, a job opportunity? It would be a Ferrari, <laughs> Phil. If I did, trust me, it would be a Ferrari, and you'd be the man I'd go to because you would know. Oh, how to do it. oh boy, what a what a. What a, what a, 
would have thought. Um, Scott Duffy mm -hmm. um, happens all the time. A man is driving in Natchez, Mississippi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's pulled over. Cops just pull him over because um, he's doing something, you know, wrong driving. And uh, the minute he bounces out of the car, he says, the body is over there. Police go into the woods, find a headless body. Uh, have you ever had someone just um, <laughs> accidentally, the police were like, what are you talking about? And they went in and found the headless body. Um, have you ever had someone accidentally admit to a crime that they weren't being accused of? Uh, just, just, just one, one in my career, but I would say that is perfect timing. <laughs> that is like, That's man, strange. I would love, I would love to, uh, to have been that patrol officer. Just he that. said, he said, it's right over there. The police officer walks 10 feet into the nearby wooded area. There is a corpse there with no head. Um, yeah. go figure. Uh, Phil Waters, we have two minutes left. The Houston Little Rascals. Have you heard of them? This is your neck of the woods. This is your town. 11, 12, 16 years Yeah, 11, 12, and 16 year old went in and robbed a Wells Fargo bank in Greens Point. Uh, that is, uh, I worked, uh, I actually worked patrol in Greens Point, and we, uh, we were affectionately referred to it as Guns Point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, as the world turns, right? Holy cow. Just when you think you've heard everything, you got an 11, a 12 year old, and a 16 year old, their little posse goes into a wealth. And they actually took the money. They took the money 11, 12, and 16. This is my daughter next year. She's like, oh, yeah, exactly. exactly. 11, 12, and 16. They arrested two off the surveillance. The third one got away. But then um, was arrested after allegedly being involved in a fight. He gets in a fight and gets recognized by a, a police officer during this fight. That's how they get the third guy, Scott Duffy, bank robbery. Well, the, two, the two little children, I believe, were turned in by their parents, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Parents did turn yeah. them in. Uh, Scott Duffy, who's the youngest bank robber that you encountered in your uh, bank? <laughs> Yeah, I did. It, it was an 18 year old and he looked like he was 11. Wow. Um, that that was a story in of itself. But but ordinarily in the in the Fed system, uh, we do not prosecute anybody. Yeah, you got to be 18 to prosecute him. Got to be 18. And only the attorney general, him or herself, can make that exception. It's got to be extreme. So I do yeah. not see this. This going so, so are these kids just going to get a juvenile slap on the wrist here? Well, I don't know what the state's going to do to them, but it's going to be. Oh, a state. the state's gonna, yeah. Well, the sixteen-year-old can be certified, but the uh, the uh, the twelve, the eleven-year-old, and the twelve-year-old, uh, yeah, they'll they're going to go through the juvenile system there. So hmm. we have a uh, real. We're about to deteriorate substantially. We're about to go down a steep uh, incline here with this next story, but. Uh, Phil Waters, are you a fan of Chipotle? That is uh, Mexican food, burritos. I'm sure they have them in Houston, Texas, big chain. Do you go in there and get a burrito occasionally? I, I've, I've eaten there before. I don't know that I'd say I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. I've probably eaten there once. I've got other uh, Tex-Mex restaurants that are much better than Chipotle, so uh, <laughs> that, I would go, that, I would, that, I, that I would frequent, but... Uh, yeah. Um, Ned Smith, again, I dislike Chipotle. I kind of don't like Chipotle either. I will love you if you want to advertise on my show, Chipotle. You'll be my favorite restaurant ever. But until then, you're okay. But um, the COE, actually, anything, anytime there's chips, salsa, or guac, the COE is so in. You know, it's her Latin root. She loves it. But um, this is just a cautionary tale. Scott Duffy, this is in your uh, Commonwealth, Pennsylvania. Turns out a Chipotle manager exposed himself, and he also um, played with himself um, yeah. in the dining room of a Pennsylvania <laughs> Chipotle. And he left, and this is a direct quote, the female victim said, and I'm quoting here, she felt three squirts of liquid hit her jeans from him, and uh, now this guy is in a lot of trouble. He's being reported. 
reported for yeah, a sex adding a, little, adding a little to the salsa, I think, there. <laughs> yes. Um, again, he said three squirts of liquid hit her jeans. I know this is going to have, um, you know. Oh, are, my gosh. How far the mighty have fallen. Uh, Catherine has got her vomit emoji. My question, Ned Smith says, of course, this is Ned Smith again, secret sauce. Um Scott or Phil, do either of you, on a broader level, do you ever worry when you run into like a fast food joint that they could be doing something? So I work out and a lot of times I'll go to Smoothie King. There's a drive through Smoothie King and I'll get a protein shake. And I'm always worried if they are angry, having a rough day, that something else could be in my protein drink. Does this thought, Scott Duffy, ever cross your mind? <laughs> It it does. It has. I did work at a Burger King, so I'm well aware <laughs> of what can happen when an, when a customer upsets you and you're the one making the food. I do understand what can happen, especially with kids these days. But um, not that I'm saying I participated in anything like that. But but there are tendencies where things fall to the ground and you. And you Pick them back up and uh Gretchen says, and we're off the crazy time. I just wish we had more time for this today. We have like another minute and a half. Uh, this next story is one that's near and dear to my heart because um having been in the news business, I like to make fun of the people in the news business. And Don Lemon is one of those guys. So he oh, yeah. uh, he left CNN, he gets paid $25 million to leave CNN. I decided to do this story. This has nothing to do with true crime, but it's all for me here. So he decides to leave true crime. I'm uh, not true crime, CNN. Almost true crime. He well, leaves, true crime, he, CNN, same, same thing. <laughs> he gets paid $25 million to leave. So then he works out a deal with Elon Musk to be on his platform. Yeah. And uh, and he promptly, he asks Elon Musk to be his first interview. Elon Musk doesn't like the interview. So within three seconds of the interview being over, he texts the Don Lemon's agent, contract terminated. But this is what he was asking for. Um he said that he wanted um, to do the first ever podcast in space. He wanted Musk to find to space and do the podcast there. He wanted a $5 million advance on top of an $8 million base salary, uh, Phil Waters. And he also wanted a cyber truck as part of the deal uh, on top of this $8 million annual salary. And then Elon Musk promptly fired him and said, go get lost. Phil Waters. The people in the media have um, um, exaggerated uh, thoughts about their own self-worth, would you say? Well, of course they do. <laughs> was... These people now, I mean, they're, they're, there's very few folks that I would... You're a throwback, Joel, in terms of journalism. Uh, these people now, they're not journalists. You know, it used to be that the journalists would report the news they'd go out and they they would work the story and they would report the news now they find themselves in a position where it's more important for them to be the news and uh you know and it, and it permeates across all of these all of these networks all of them hmm. so uh, you know there's very few of these bozos i even watch on any of these networks I, I, I'm so disgusted with all of them that I don't, I don't care to hear any of them because they're always Musk, pontificating about themselves more than anything else. A thousand percent. And I'm going to make this, um, this known publicly right now. Elon Musk, I know you listen to this show. I know you're a huge fan. Scott, <laughs> Phil, and I will do this show for you on your platform. We'll get you 10 times the viewers that Don Lamone could ever get you. We'll do it for 1.5 million a piece. A Ferrari for Phil, a cyber truck for me, and Scott Duffy wants his own rocket ship. You've got a deal. Yeah. Let us know. Um, you know, Ferrari's come out with a hybrid and they're they're coming out with a hybrid. And they I think they're coming out with some sort of electric nonsense, which I think is all a bunch of joke. But um if it would make Elon feel any better, I would at least go for the hybrid if if that would make him, you know, the electric stuff and all that stuff. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to him. But the truth is, we would deliver way better numbers than Don Lamone will ever deliver. K9 Catherine, Why Lover, and Maui, Network News Obsolete. If you're not on 
the YouTube here, uh, then you're you're missing out. Um, someone says, "Oh, the panty wadding." The final story, and then we've got to run. Um, the world happiness rankings came out. The United States fell off of the top twenty. Uh, Scott Duffy, can you guess which country is the number one happiest country in the world? Scott Duffy, like from the top of my head, top of your head in the whole Finland. world. You read the <laughs> great guess, great guess, man. Yeah, that was a really yeah. It is Finland. Uh, the U.S. fell off. There's a war in Israel, and amazingly, Israel is ranked fifth. And this was done during the time of the war. Um, people there are happy that the order goes: Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, Israel, Netherlands, Norway, Luxembourg, Switzerland. Australia. So uh, there you go. Scott, uh, Phil Waters. Lichten, Lichtenstein's not on that list. And it is not. Uh, it is not. Phil Lichtenstein Waters. is right there in Luxembourg, but it's all in that little area. And I had some of the best pizza in the world in Lichtenstein. Really? And the guy that made it looked like Elvis. Interesting. Interesting. Like a fifth, like a 60 year old Elvis with dyed black hair. And it was in a mullet. It was pretty. I'll show you. I'll send you the pictures. I took pictures of the pizza. I was so impressed. I took pictures of the pizza. Send it to me, and oh I will post it on Instagram, at Surviving the Survivor. Listen, we have to run. We never end this abruptly. It's usually a long, drawn-out thing, but these guys had to go. I have to go. Love you, America. Love you, Caleb Harris. I hope they find you. Riley Strain, I'm very sorry, but we're going to listen to the parents' press conference. Phil and Scott, uh, I think the world of both of you. Uh, do me a favor. Get me an extra burrito at Chipotle this weekend and uh, FedEx it to me. Uh, when you're there eating. Enjoy your meal. Love you, America. Here we go. Adios. Wait, I was just about to do something I wasn't supposed to do. Here we go.